Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, inside looks at our team, and more. Today's episode is actually a deep dive all about recovery. So we're going to start with a general overview of the topic of recovery and then work our way into some applicable tips to ensure you're doing everything you can to maximize things on your end. So as always, it is our goal not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on topics or questions, but also plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, let's get into today's topic, which is recovery. And I want to give a brief overview, a uh, very general overview of kind of what recovery is, the context that we're putting it in today. Um, and that's going to kind of help guide that discussion uh, throughout this podcast. So arguably one of the most important variables of training is going to be your recovery. Right. So strength training breaks down your muscles alongside other tissues and systems in your body. The time spent maximizing recovery helps us adapt from our training uh, past those original levels, which this is how our muscle strength and endurance are acquired or acquired rather. So without adequate recovery, training performance will suffer and you'll not be able to properly adapt to your training over time. This is why rest days are important alongside quality sleep nutrition, stress management, and things that we're going to go over. So I want to hand it over to Sue here, um, and she's going to kind of introduce all the topics that we're going to go over today. Uh, we're going to get right into it from there. Perfect. Yeah, we're going to highlight just those main topics we're going to go over so you know those main pillars as well that you want to pay attention to when it does come to recovery. So we're going to be diving into nutrition, training, sleep, water intake, movement outside of training, stress management, and supplementation. And the main sentence we really want you to take away from this and to remember is you want to train hard and recover harder. Uh, oftentimes, it's just train, train, train. That's all that matters. And that's all people try to optimize. But without those adaptations that Austin was talking about, when he says adaptations, adaptations equals progress. Adaptations means that you're able to keep going. So if you're not having adaptations, you're not seeing progress forward or you are not optimizing your progress forward. So we want to be able to have those adaptations to be able to keep progressing in our training and minimize as many plateaus as possible. And recovery is a huge, huge point of that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start off with new nutrition if Alex wants to take it over. All right. So when we are looking to to optimize recovery, we are going to, uh, within nutrition, focus on protein intake and focus on total calories. So in the, in the gist of maximizing uh, recovery, we're going to need to be at least at a caloric maintenance into a caloric surplus. Now, can you still recover well uh, in a deficit? Certainly. Um, but we're talking about maximizing. So to maximize that, you want to be in a maintenance or in a surplus. So to, um, to establish that, what we recommend is that you would do three to seven days of a caloric uh, recall, uh, tracking your weight, as well as, as tracking your caloric intake once you get the average from there, seeing what the average within your weight is as well is going to be important so that you can establish whether that is your caloric maintenance. If your weight stays pretty steady within one to, to three pounds, I would say would be a, a good little maintenance set point. And then you can make increases to that 100 to 150 calories per day would be a pretty decent little surplus from that intake. But that would be where we would establish calories at that point. From there, what we're looking at within protein is going to be 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass. Now, are you going to have a concrete number within your lean body mass without a, a DEXA scan of sorts or a, a bod pod or anything like that? No, but we can have a, a rough idea within uh, potentially uh, a, a leaner state of you or just a, a rough idea within your your. Um, body mass as a whole. So we want to have the, the protein in there. We want to have the total calories in place. Now, from there, how we disperse the protein is going to be very important as well. So what we find from a research perspective is that the minimum threshold within protein feedings is going to be 20 to 25 grams of protein per feeding to allow for muscle protein synthesis to be maximized. And that's what we certainly want to transpire when we're trying to maximize recovery. Now we can split that into four to five feedings per day. Now, five feedings may be a lot for individuals and, and that's okay, but four is going to be kind of that, that sweet spot. Within this, you can have uh, you know three full meals and maybe two snacks that are uh, like a, a carb 
snack plus the a protein shake or something of that nature you could have like three full meals and then two snacks or you could do you know four full meals it's really up to you as long as you're getting that protein in place so those are going to be the important components now from there we look at peri workout nutrition so making sure that we're getting adequate carbohydrates as well as that adequate protein that we just spoke on in your pre and post workout meals now the timing around the training is going to be very important as well so in terms of consuming that pre-workout meal, it's going to be good to have that between 90 to 120 minutes prior to the training session, depending on the size of that. When we look at the percentage of your total carbohydrates that we want to consume around the training, it's going to be um, 25 to 50% of your daily caloric, or I'm sorry, your daily carbohydrate intake that is within that meal specifically. It, it, that could be very high. That could be very low, depending on your total carbohydrates that you're consuming per day. But that allows for us to have adequate fuel sources within the training. And then the, the protein consumption being at a minimum of 20 to 25 grams within those meals as well. Now, when we look at post-workout meals, this is a very large component to the recovery process as well. They does not need to be consumed immediately following the training session. I'm su sure that many of you have seen um, that you, you have to consume protein as fast as possible to get the recovery process kickstarted. And, and that is not the case. We advise our clients to wait until their heart rate gets down to around that resting heart rate, whatever that would be for you. But this is going to allow for you to digest and metabolize the nutrients at a much better rate, absorb the nutrients at a much better rate uh, when you're in that rest and digest state. We've talked about on the podcast a number of times the uh, parasympathetic activity, sympathetic activity within the ner uh, nervous system, um, and we want to be in a parasympathetic state when we are consuming those post-workout meals. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I wanted to highlight in that is he did talk about being at maintenance or surplus, and there is research to show that timing for meals and some of these aspects matter a little bit less when you're at maintenance or surplus. But when you are in a deficit, because you are not in a place where you're able to maximize recovery, it's something that you really, really want to pay attention to some of these um, more finer details. Um, and especially Alex works with a lot of competitors. And so he is working with people in extreme deficits, not just lifestyle deficits. Um, and it's something that if recovery isn't optimized, progress isn't made forward either. So um, if Alex wants to touch a little bit on recovery within prep clients, he can. Uh, but the last thing I'll put in that section um, is just that if you are a newer trainer and you're like, well, I have to pay attention to my heart rate and I have to listen to all these intricacies. I want you to take the gist of a lot of this. So we're talking about making sure that your nutrition is in the best spot, making sure that you're sleeping, making sure you're managing your stress. So take these and take those baby steps forward. Don't think that you have to overcomplicate it um, right starting off. Yes, it is complex. And I don't want to just sit here and try to completely simplify it past the point that it needs to be simplified. But do take this and apply it to your life instead of saying, I need to do everything that they just mentioned in this podcast right now, tomorrow after I train. Um, you want to be able to troubleshoot it with yourself. Um, and then within the pre and post workout meals, really finding out what meals sit well within your digestion is going to be important as well. Yeah. And I, I just, the only thing I'll add there in, in terms of context, again, is kind of going a little bit more into the nuance. Um, I would say from a perspective um, that I've found with myself and, and with other clients, um, the larger the individual, so the more muscular the individual and the deeper the deficit is, the more that the, sort of the nuance of that post-workout shake does come into play, right? And, and then you guys kind of alluded to that and mentioned that. Um, and again, this is more for like very large, very muscular people um, or above the average of muscularity and those people that are deep into deficits. And it can help, uh, you know, 25 to 30 grams of protein and, you know, 25 to 30 grams of carbohydrates quickly in a shake post-workout can absolutely help that nervous system calm down, but calm down a bit more. Um, you can add things in, you know, things like theanine or taurine in there, which uh, can help as well. Uh, and that's again, very, it's more advanced. Um, but I did want to kind of mention that nuance because I know we have some competitors. I know we do have some more advanced people in here. So again, general topics being taken here are very important. Understand context for you. Um, and understand that to make progress, you don't have to be the most advanced person as far as these tactics go, but understand that like, if you are really muscular, 
Um, and if you are deep into a deficit, these may help you uh, more so than anything. So that's the only thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, and I think that another aspect within this uh, would be fiber consumption. So keeping this at a, a minimum within the pre and post workout meals, more so the pre workout meal, as we don't want that to be slowing the digestion of nutrients going into that training session to be weighing heavy on your stomach as you go into train. Um, and then that also speaks on fats as well. So fats are going to be minimal for a majority of, of individuals within that pre-workout meal, uh, as well as, I mean, you're biasing carbohydrates and protein within both of those meals, most specifically for a majority of individuals. So that's going to be a main component. And then within, um, you know, vitamins, minerals, and, and micronutrients, those are all going to be exponentially important throughout your diet, um, on a, a full day spectrum, not even just speaking on peri-workout nutrition. Um, but that is going to be a big piece of you just adding quality muscle tissue, keeping internal function maximized. Because when we look at just recovery as a whole, we need to be focusing on the whole day. It's not just the, the one hour that you're in the gym. The recovery is transpiring the 23 hours uh, outside of that you know, training session. So you need to really prioritize all that. And we'll you know speak on all those components here shortly. Awesome. So a little brief uh, breakdown of water intake and the importance of that when it comes to health and performance. Um, this also falls under the umbrella of strength and, and hypertrophy and stuff like that. Again, to grow muscle, we have to have a high level of performance and a high level of recoverability to be able to create an environment within our bodies to say, hey, thumbs up here let's move forward with this muscle growth process. Cause that's a very expensive, hard thing to do for your body. Um, if you've ever seen those charts, anyone like it's seemingly this giant complex thing of all the checks and balances that have to go right for you to sort of grow muscle and, and for your body to say, Hey, we're in a great environment to do so. Okay. So I know in a lot of contexts and terms, um, and you may hear on a lot of different podcasts that, Hey guys, this is simple. This is easy to do. And it's like in context, sure, in terms of like, just hit your protein intake and train, but it's very, very, very complex for your body, right? So we may kind of simplify it a little bit, um, but it's very complex. Okay, so in water intake, this is going to play in um, to those strength and performance and health markers that do play into recoverability. Okay, so water intake, our bodies are 55 to 60% water. Our muscles are up to 75% water we are water <laughs> in a large way we depend on it right water acts as a solvent a catalyst for chemical reactions sort of think of think of a catalyst sort of as that that if there was gas in a room and you lit a match sort of like that starter spark that's sort of that catalyst for chemical reactions so it, it helps get those reactions going um, it acts as a lubricant um, a, a thermoregulatory mechanism in terms of controlling body temperature allowing you to sweat uh, and things like that so you'll notice if you've ever been dehydrated, you, you're like, hey, I should be sweating here and I'm not. What's the problem? Like, and I also feel like garbage. Well, you're very <laughs> dehydrated, right? So if you if you're in a position where you were sweating a lot, um, you know, I know Alex and I used to run into this with, with football and, and different sports growing up. Um, you know, they kept very close tabs on, you know, are are we continuously sweating throughout practice, you know, during two a days in, in the middle of summer, right? So if you're out there and you're, you know, getting cold shivers and it's 105 degrees out there and you're not sweating and it's like, wow, this is a problem, right? So water does play a huge role in that, that thermoregulatory mechanism of controlling temperature, allowing us to sweat, um, and sort of wick away that heat from the internal parts of our body to help that body stay at that sort of homeostasis of temperature. It likes to stay at for everything to run optimally. Right. It's, an, it's also an important source of minerals, right? We get a lot of minerals from our water. The management of water coming in and out of the body, again, this is known as fluid balance, right? So you kind of always talk about, sort of think of it in the same principles of sort of a simplified calories in, calories out. It's a water in, water out system. So if you're drinking, if you're sweating a lot, you need more water. If you're sweating a lot, you need more water plus electrolytes. Um, and be sure that you aren't just chugging water and not also helping replenish some of those electrolytes. And for a lot of clients, you know, to sort of cover these bases, we recommend an electrolyte supplement that we really like. Um, we'll put that in the show notes, but 
you know, it's an electrolyte supplement that just helps cover your bases. One, to, you know, one tiny scoop a day can go a long way um, in, in just helping hydrate those cells, keep you hydrated, allow yourself not to flush out all those electrolytes through your urine and stuff like that. Um, as you do increase your water intake, she'll notice, hey, I got I even got a question the other day from a client. Hey, when I start to drink more water, do I, am I supposed to go to the bathroom every five minutes? And it's like, well, at first you're going to pee more. If you drink more water, you're going, your body's going to have to start to regulate that a bit more. It's going to upregulate certain things. Um, and your kidneys are going to have to deal with that, but they will even out. And, and in a couple of days, it's not going to be as noticeable. And within a week's time, you're not, it's going to be like normal, right? So your body's very resilient in that way. Uh, but it is important. There is something such as hyperhydration, sort of the opposite uh, anti-hero to uh, dehydration. So if you are hyperhydrated, that's where you can run into problems as well, right? So there is sort of that healthy balance of hydration. Um, so, you know, d don't drink, uh, you know, a cup of water a day and don't drink six gallons of water a day. You know, there's there's definitely a middle ground uh, and there's there's a place within that continuum of, of healthy behavior. Okay. And so again, delicate balance here, uh, but it does play into your health and performance goals and it's going to play into your ability to recover, to feel good, uh, both physically, cognitively, uh, and, and everything like that. So water is very important. And it's also something that helps with delivering nutrients to your body. So if you ever notice that your digestion is a little downregulated one day, um, and then you can kind of have that recall of, hey, have I drank enough water today to be able to facilitate this moving forward? Um, and with water goals, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people carrying around gallon bottle waters um, or gallon jugs. Um, and you don't have to do that. You 100% can. If that is your thing, do it. Uh, but you can still reach your water goals without doing that. So don't feel like you have to choose one or the other. Um, so another thing is water bottles are great gifts because I have a lot of people in my life who do not drink enough water. And so getting them a water bottle is an easy gift to be looking out for their health um, as well as uh, I just love my water bottle all in all. So we do have a video on the physique development YouTube and we'll link that in the show notes talking about how to get more water if you've ever struggled with hitting your water goals. So we'll go ahead and go into sleep here. Um, so when it comes down to sleep, this is something where a lot of people like to be and say sleep is for the weak, but we do not want to have that mentality. Again, within our society, it is a very grind, 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 24-7, no days off. And we we want days off. But if you haven't caught the gist yet from recoverability, you want to be able to recover. And sleep is a huge, huge part of that. And it could be the missing element in your fitness routine. I have had clients, and I'm sure these guys can say the same with their clients. I've had clients that they are on top of everything but sleep. And that is 100% stalling their progress to be able to move things forward. Um, so within that, if you've gotten some bad nights of sleep and you're like, well, I, I got to get to the gym today because I, I just have to, I was supposed to train today, uh, be able to take a second and recognize if that training session is going to be beneficial if you're at that point of very down regulated because not having good quality sleep for multiple nights in a row. I know when we first got Tucker, <laughs> we had multiple nights of no sleep and there were a few extra rest days thrown in there for not only our sanity, but also for us to be able to actually recover from training. Um, so I'll go into some things with sleep. And then Alex is going to touch on a little bit more about the hormonal side, looking at leptin and ghrelin, um, as well as he can throw in what I'm like when I don't get enough sleep if he, if he feels like it. But um, so when it comes to sleep, our bodies are not wired for sleep deprivation, like I said. So instead of thinking sleep is for the weak, what you want to think is sleep is for the elite the elite of the elite want to get good sleep there. Um, so sleep affects almost every process in the body one way or another. So with a lack of sleep and especially chronic lack of sleep, you disrupt how your body sends information. You make it more difficult to concentrate or learn new things. You can decrease coordination and balance. It can negatively affect your mental abilities and emotional state. It can compromise decision-making processes and creativity. You can weaken, weaken your immune system, which we do not have time for right 
right now. Um, you can worsen existing respiratory diseases or issues, and it can not only affect your bowel movements, kind of as I talked about within water, but it can also lead to fat gain as it increases levels of ghrelin and decreases levels of leptin. And then it can make you too tired to train or make your training sessions lower quality or at more risk for injury. And then it can reduce your fat cells ability to respond properly to insulin, which that can promote fat storage. And it can also increase risk for diabetes. And it affects your blood sugar, blood pressure, inflammation levels in your body. It's linked to increased risk of heart attack or stroke. And it can affect even more hormones than those I mentioned, like your testosterone and growth hormones. So one thing that you can also remember about sleep, it is free. So it is a free thing that you can do to be able to maximize your training. Because when it comes to people asking, okay, how can I get better? Do I need to be doing something else? It's like, are you sleeping? That is one thing you can really ask yourself, am I getting good quality sleep? Um, And that is going to be something that you could 100% see some huge strides within training with some better quality sleep in place. So if Alex, you want to touch on the leptin and ghrelin a little bit more? I absolutely can. And I think that uh, one thing to add to Sue's sleep portion here is that uh, I think that many people get caught up in their to do list potentially. And what happens is that the list may not be complete and you you stay up later and later and later and, and try to get that done. And then you're trying to wake up at the exact same time the following day. And then it just turns into this very slippery slope of less and less productive work. Whereas if you would have just cut off and been like, Hey, I took an L today and that's okay. And went to bed at a normal time, uh, got your adequate sleep. You were much more productive the following day. You were able to actually catch up on the stuff that you you fell behind on. It's going to be much more productive for you. I know that in the moment it's like, I should just, you know, power through and get this done. The, the reality of things is, is that we like when you're doing your work, you want it to be quality and efficient. It's not just checking things off of your list. So prioritizing those things over just crossing things off the list. Now he is sub podcasting me right now. Instead of sub tweeting, he's sub podcasting me right this second. (laughs) We had this conversation the other day that he was like, stop trying to stay up and just finish the work, go and get some sleep. So I will eat my own words there and a new term sub podcasting. Yeah. And and for in, in that context, online coaches who are listening, your coach or your clients are going to respect you a whole hell of a lot more. If you even if let's say you fall out of the the time window, I know that it's a hot topic on Instagram to be like, if your coach isn't responding within 24 hours, fuck them. And it's like, okay, let's relax on the the concretes on the numbers there. Th- the reality is, is that I may be longer than 24 hours, but the quality of my response is going to be extremely detailed and I'm going to answer all the questions. I'm going to give proper context to everything. And if that takes me a little bit longer than the the 24 hour window, 36 hour window, whatever you're giving your clients, I as a consumer would prefer that rather than me stay up till midnight, give a half-assed response just so that I can fall within that window. Now, um, that's me personally. And that's something that we employ within physique development and clients are are extremely respectful of that. Um, But back to the topic here. (laughs) Just just let them know it's going to be a little right. right, right. (laughs) I mean, let them know, don't, don't give them expectations, obviously, that it's one way or the other. But I think that, um, you know, being honest with them is important. Okay, so let's discuss, uh, discussed. (laughs) Let's discuss leptin and ghrelin. So when we look at at leptin, this is going to make you less hungry. I'm I'm going to really generalize this. So leptin is going to um, be stored in adipose tissue. It's going to signal to your brain that, hey, we're full. And then you have ghrelin, which is going to make you more hungry. It's going to be like, hey, when's the next meal, bro? I'm getting a little bit hungry. Those are your two main um, hunger signals. Now, they're going to, it's not that they work independently. There's within your your hormonal function, everything is is connected. And it's a, a little bit of a puzzle as you work through the, the circle here. But when you look at leptin and ghrelin, what transpires is that if you're not getting enough sleep, and, and they've done studies in, in terms of acute and long term sleep deprivation, and the the hunger signaling is is one of the things that even just in the acute sense is very much so effective. So let's say that you a couple nights in a row, you are 
having to study for an exam or something of that nature, you're getting two to three hours of sleep each night, your cortisol is through the roof, you're very irritable. Um, and, and what's happening is that that leptin secretion is is either down regulated, or you're not having enough of it being secreted. Thus, you're just either constantly hungry, or you're not having that. And you are also having this excess of cortisol. So you kind of just feel crummy as a whole. So both of those working in conjunction is a pretty bad place to be in and something to be cognizant of when you do have those lower, I'm sorry, those, those poor sleep nights is making sure that you're still hitting your food, making sure you're getting plenty of, um, micronutrients, getting plenty of fruits and vegetables within your diet, keeping your water intake up. It's very important to stay within your nutritional intake on those days that are following just crummy sleep or, um, excessively late nights or, or what have you. It, it's even more of a priority at that point, uh, coming off of very poor sleep. I think it's an important thing to mention there really quick that this is where having a plan and a structure with your nutrition can really help. Um, it's not that, you know, if you're not into the tracking of macros, um, you know, that's fine, but having some sort of semblance of structure, routine, general times where you typically eat meals, um, throughout your day, things like that. And what those meals are going to look like, what you know are good decisions, having those in place before you hit these points is great, right? So waking up, every day, like, oh my gosh, every day is a new day for macros. I can just eat like I want every day. So today I'll do pizza at 10 a.m., but tomorrow I'm gonna wake up at 5 a.m. and have a salad. And like, clearly no, probably no one eats like that, but I'm just saying for this general sense of the term or the point here, have some semblance of structure and have something to sort of lean on when you get stressed, when you lose some sleep, because being able to fall back on that is an incredible, value to yourself and to your long-term progress, to your sanity on that given day, how you're going to feel. Um, and then just sort of counteracting what can hormonally sort of work against you in the, the acute sense of, of losing sleep, being super stressed out and something that, you know, you don't want that not necessarily, necessarily again, snowball and, and turn into this cycle of chronic sleep deprivation, because that not only extrapolates those acute issues, but it also sort of picks up new ones as it starts to snowball down that hill, right? So we want to sort of nip that in the bud. Everyone has poor sleep sometimes. Everyone has a shitty night of sleep, whatever. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. You're, you're, you're fine. But what is a problem is if you don't start to take care of it and you don't start to address the underlying problems of maybe what's causing that, that's when it becomes a problem. And if you do need some tips on how to improve your sleep, we do have an article on the Physique Development website, which will be linked in the podcast notes. Yeah, I think it's six steps to improving your sleep or something. So, you know, it's just basically it goes over uh, good habits, a healthy sleep routine, sleep hygiene is sometimes used, um, but just having a good routine going into bed, understanding what sort of, again, counteracts those things for your body to fall asleep. And, and one thing I like, you know, Alan Kress talks about this a lot, but it's preparing your body for sleep. You know, this is something I like that, that Alan does talk about. And it's, you don't just assume like, okay, it's time to sleep. Our body's like, all right, dope. I'm on the same page. Um, you know, if you're staring at screens all day, if you're, if you're drinking coffee throughout the afternoon, if you're doing X, Y, and Z, whatever that is, your body probably isn't necessarily always in tune with its natural rhythm of things. So being able to actually prepare yourself a little bit more and be a little bit more aware of those things going into the night as the sun starts to go down and, and whatever else actually fall into a routine. Again, routine and structure can really help. And our body does like routine and structure and the way that it works off its own circadian rhythm. And, and it's sort of its own 24 hour time clock, uh, if you will, which we do run off of, right. And our, our brain helps regulate that for the rest of our body and the rest of our cells throughout the body. So, and having that routine is big. Um, so anyways, that article is great. Very brief, but great. So training, um, I'll talk a little bit about training and, you know, we've, we've been asked before, you know, outside of sleep, nutrition, supplementation, like does anything else play into recovery? And it's like, yeah, training in a large way plays into your ability to recover right? If you're training beyond your capabilities at the current moment, if you're training beyond your recoverability capacity, meaning 
you're training with too much volume, too much intensity, too much sort of density. Um, so really short rest periods, a lot of metabolic fatigue, um, and a lot of volume of that over, you know, even, even if you do that for a day, you'll, you may see disruption in the rest of your week. You may see disruption in your sleep, in your hunger, in X, Y, and Z, right? So this is where periodizing, regulating your training, understanding what those limits are for you. And again, there is sort of this gap period or this, this continuum, if you will, I think it's the best way to really put it, that you can sort of live in the middle of that. There is a lot of gray area that I think you can live in. It's not that you have to fit perfectly within this, you know, you're in slot A, Alex and says, you know, I'm in slot A, Alex in slot B, Susan slot C, what I, in terms of what we can and cannot do on a day in and day out basis from a training perspective, but you have a range, but it's very, very important to understand where that range lives, right? And so we would talk about volume allocation. You know, we've had clients come to us that are doing, and we've definitely done it in the past. If you, if you want to listen to episode nine, we go all over how we were, you know, do, training probably with 40 to 50 sets in a week on, you know, delts or arms or, or chest or whatever we were doing at the time. Um, but we, we definitely have clients that come to us that are, you know, they're training with, 30, 40 plus sets per week on multiple muscle groups throughout the week. And just to give you context within, within the research, and again, there's nuance within this, but within the research, a good range is somewhere between, between that 10 and tw that 10 sets per week per muscle group, all the way up to maybe 24 ish sets per muscle group for most individuals, right? There are outliers. There are more advanced people. There are people who are in caloric surpluses, who are genetic freaks, who can seemingly out do those 24 sets per week people, right? So don't just, don't tell your friend he's dumb if he's progressing on more than that. But what I am saying is there is that range, right? And that's important to know. So if you, you know, clients come to us, we know that range is. And for most people, that's the better they are at creating tension, the more advanced they are in their training career. Well, maybe the, really the less volume they may need if it's quality volume right? If their programming's correct, if, if everything's going as planned and we're going through these different phases and actually transitioning and periodizing and progressing through these training phases appropriately towards their goal, right? This is very, very important. So when a client comes to us doing 40 plus sets per week on something, right? And, and they, they may be even doing that in one day's time. So the biggest part and, and they're complaining or their progress is stalled or they're, they're saying that they're not recovering. They're, they're constantly sore. They're not, their strength isn't going up. Their performance is stalled, things like that. And that's where these volume allocations and, and understanding really how to spread out volume throughout the weeks, understand how much total volume you should do, right? So that 10 to 20 ish uh, sets per week per muscle group is a great place to start. And then you know, understand that training a muscle group two to three times per week is probably a good idea. We, even, we know that to be true. So what you can do is take each muscle group and very easily sort of spread out that volume, right? So if you're hitting chest and back, you're doing that two, maybe two times per week, and you want to hit 12 sets per week that week on chest and back, well, it's six sets for each muscle group on day one, hit another six sets for each muscle group on day two. There you go. There's 12 sets in the week for chest and back. Very, very simple. Um, and it's a good way to sort of regulate training volume and allow yourself to sort of incrementally and steadily progress that over time and be able to, to keep that strength performance on the higher end of things, allow progress to happen. And this definitely also plays into body composition as well, right? So if you're, if you're overtraining and Sue's going to get <clears throat> a little bit into the, the symptoms of that next, but if you are overtraining, and under recovering essentially is what that is going to play into that is going to lead into a lot of different things. And we'll let Sue touch on that right now. Yeah. And just like I said, within sleep where it's not that sleep is for the week and we need to grind 24 seven, it's the same within training. There are going to be different training stimuli in place. And so don't think I always need to have my heart rate super high during training or I'm not seeing progress. There's different allocations you can have. There's different adaptations to be made there. So when it comes to overtraining or when it comes to training in general, don't think that you're only getting a good session if you're sweating, if you're sore, if your heart rate is super high, because there are going to be 
different types of training in place. But when it comes to overtraining, so you might notice this if you're always trying to get your heart rate up or anything like that. Um, when we're looking at some of the symptoms or side effects or things you may feel if you are overtrained, and if you nod along to a lot of these, then reassess what you're doing, take some extra rest days or heed the rest of the advice in this podcast. Um, so if you have the inability to recover, huge one where you just feel like you never are fully recovered to go ahead and hit the next next musculature or you're constantly sore and fatigued. If you're unenthusiastic about training, now, of course, every once in a while we're going to be, but if it's something you love and you notice this huge shift in your mentality, that's going to be a big sign. Decreased performance, increased perceived effort, agitated, and then it can affect your sleep and your digestion. So these all are interconnected. Um, it can change your appetite, have nagging injuries, and a lot more here. So but too much of a good thing can still be detrimental to your health and impact your long-term progress. So um, just some things to keep an eye out for. If, like I said, if you're nodding along with a lot of those, like, yep, I feel that. Yep, I feel that. And then maybe it's time to take a deload or reassess how you're training or these other recovery variables that we are talking about. Now, when it comes to looking at um, training and looking at um, some things that we can do to help if we're having soreness is making sure that we're not just being blobs the rest of the day. Um, so Alex, if you kind of want to talk on moving throughout the day to make sure that blood flow is is going towards those muscles. Yeah, I think that um, keeping up your physical activity throughout the day is is important. I, I now on Instagram, again, I will say that it's, uh, you know, 10k steps is, is your big marker. Like if I can get that I'm a healthy individual and I'm, I care about myself. And the reality of that is, is it doesn't have to be 10K. I think that having a rough idea of where your activity is throughout the day for my, well, all three of us here, if we were to not focus on getting steps in outside of, of work, it would be uh, very, very low as we've talked about, I think, in other episodes. But I think that having a rough idea, let's say that you generally get five or 6,000 steps, maybe you bump that up to seven, maybe up to eight. But having that uh, circulation of nutrients, circulation of, of blood flow is going to be very important to your overall recovery. I'm sure that many of you have had leg sessions where you feel as though you should just lay around the rest of the day, and then you wake up feeling like a stiff board the following day. Now, um, we've all been there, it would be in your best interest to probably get some walks in as well as getting some static stretching, maybe some yoga done to allow for recovery to be even more optimized to be at a quicker rate as well. Yeah. And that's where you'll hear, hear, hear the term active recovery or active recovery days, but don't feel like you need to go overboard. Rest is very, 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 very important Yes, I can't say it enough. So don't feel like any day that you're not training, you have to be moving your body and hitting that goal. It's something of, okay, maybe I'm going to go on a walk with my husband, or maybe I'm going to go walk my dogs super leisurely. It's not something where you're tracking your heart rate and making sure you're good to go. It's truly just making sure that there's blood flow to your body. So it could be something just like stretching or yoga um, or throwing the ball with the dog. Um, so be able to be aware of that. And I hope none of you were listening to this out loud and me saying the B-A-L-L -L word hopefully didn't make your dog go crazy. But <laughs> we'll go ahead into stress management or touch on it here quickly. Um, so stress is something that is created equal. And when we want to look at stress, stress isn't just like, oh, I feel stressed today. Stress is going to be training as a stressor on your body, then looking at job stress, emotional stress, relationship stress, and anything else that is all going to be something that you need to be able to recover from that level of stress. So that's when people have very high and chronic stress that they feel like they can't recover from training, even if they are doing everything they need to do with food and all of that, but their stress is so high, it is affecting those strength adaptations, it's affecting their recoverability. So really, really making sure that you are taking hold of what is stressors in your life and always taking time to reassess that. It's something that we have on a question as our, um, our check-in sheet. And it's something we always want to be aware of because just like sleep can derail your progress, stress can 100% derail your progress. So some tips very quickly about stress is being able to write down what you're stressed about. This is a um, activity I have clients do a lot when there's like, my stress is so high right now because I used to live in a chronically stressed place without even realizing I was in a chronically stressed place. Now I realize it and I just need to be better. But before I truly did not realize it because 
I just was in this constant state of stress and it just became my normal, um, which is very normal for it to become your normal. So being able to write down like the top 10 things that are stressing you right now, even if it's something like getting your house clean or doing your laundry, that can still be on the list. And then being able to go through and see what you can assess. So if it is doing your laundry, okay, maybe I take an extra rest day from the gym, I get shit figured out at my home, and then I'm going to feel better. I got something knocked off of my list. Um, But maybe it's something within your job that you can't necessarily change. Maybe it's the coworkers you're around, but being able to set better boundaries, create, um, protect your space and your energy the best that you can. But knowing what your stressors are will allow you to attack them a little bit better than this being like, I'm just stressed, which is just a common answer of like, hey, how are you doing? Uh, You know, just stressed. So being able to know what you're just stressed about is going to be very, very helpful. Um, So there's going to be stress in life. No doubt, everyone's going to have stressful moments, but being able to have helpful things that you go to when you are stressed. So if Alex and Austin want to touch on like, hey, if I'm stressed, these are the things that I do to kind of relieve relieve my stress or to lower my stress. Um, I think that would be helpful just to see what other people do in those times of stress. Go ahead, I got it, man. Oh, I know you go. You're first. <laughs> um, okay. So in terms of, of me dealing with, with stress, I think that it starts with, um, with the three of us being business owners, the, the list of, of tasks and things that we could do per day could truly be endless. I mean, we could stay up 24 hours and, and probably still have things that we need to get done. So mine starts with, with, um, being very intentional with the expectations of the time that I have that specific day and not making this laundry list of, uh, of things that I need to get done when I'm, I'm putting myself in a very, uh, lose, lose situation where there's no way that I get all those tasks done. It it may look nice on paper of like, you know what, I I've got lots of energy right now. I'm going to be able to get all this stuff done. When in reality, it's like you, I could probably get four, maybe five of those 20 tasks done. And then that's probably the cap where, it, that is a win for the day. But when I look at that list, it's like, shit, I, I didn't get 15 things done. I, I, you know, really bad day again. And it's like, I just didn't set, set myself up for success. So that's the very first thing. And then from there, understanding where my energy is at for that day. So some days I've, I've got five really big tasks that I need to get done. And some days there's only three tasks and I've got kind of the bare minimum of things that I need to get done to cross those things off of my list. So it all starts with expectations for me personally. And then something that I'm really working on, and I I think that I've, this has been kind of like a new year's resolution for years now is, is truly taking time off. Um, I'm doing a little bit better of a job now. And as we talked about earlier is having a hard cutoff time for when work ends for the day has been huge for me personally, not to work into the night and to just get things done to cross them off the list, but more so focusing on the, the quality of that work. So having a hard cutoff time, quality expectations, managing my morning is, is big as well. So getting my cardio done, getting uh, a little bit of reading done, spend, playing with the dog, spending time with Sue for a little bit. First thing in the morning is very important for me just to go into the day um, with an optimistic mind. I know for myself, I've got to go in with controlling those things first. If I do not control those things first, I'm already starting off on a bad foot and kind of getting ran by the day. So, um, yeah, just grabbing the the day by the horns is, is my big thing. Yeah. And I think the, the bookends to the day is very important, right? How do you, how do you start in your day? And, you know, I don't have dogs, but I do have a, a wonderful wife and, and I as well like to to spend the morning with her, right? So coffee, cooking breakfast, um, maybe taking a short walk, maybe just reading instead, whatever that is, really starting our day out on a high note. And again, this is a luxury of what we do for a living, right? We don't have to, our, our, our clocking in, we don't have a trans sort of a, uh, a commute to work is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but so our commute to work is, is, you know, non-existent. So it's like, okay, well, let's spend that time wisely. Let's book in that day with things that bring us joy, that fill our cup, that allow us to then pour into the work that we're doing that day. And so as Alex was saying, um, you know, it's not necessarily the work that we do specifically and then the work that you do as as coaches listening, um, or if you have a service-based job, a client-based job, you're not just getting answers to people. You're not just checking off things off your list. You're not just trudging through emails to trudge through them, right? It's, it's getting people quality responses. It's educating. It's, it's showing up. It's being empathetic. It's, it's doing all of these things. 
right? And to do that, you have to have energy, and to do that, you have to have the the sense of the, the sense of calm and the sense of of well being for yourself to actually pour that into others, right? And, and that's a big thing. So I think booking in your day was was a great thing to bring up. Um, and the only other thing that that I do, um, you know, on a consistent basis, really is is towards that stress or, or towards feeling overwhelmed, it, it's sort of just writing stuff down, putting it, you know, uh, allowing myself to to look at something with objectivity and, and subjectivity and context and, and the nuance uh, specifically, but writing it down, allowing it to get out of my own head, right? Because like your head is a vast, vast sort of black hole of chaos of things just pinging around like a pinball machine in there all day and night. So the more that you can sort of clear your head, do a brain dump, do a whatever you got to do, get it all out onto paper, right? This doesn't have to be structured in any way. Mine sure, sure as shit is not. Um, but it's just getting everything out onto paper. It's whatever I'm feeling at the moment. Am I frustrated? Am I stressed? Am I, am I anxious about something? Am I, am I overwhelmed about tasks? Am I, you know, what, what am I? And it's just getting that onto paper. Maybe I just write down my to-do list for the day and that's it, Right. It's just getting it out on the paper, out of my head, or I, I write down my anxieties and then maybe thinking about how I deal with those. Um, so writing them down, getting them out of your own head is, is the only thing that I really wanted to mention there that I've seen with myself and, and I'm working on with a lot of my clients um, to try and help them through a lot of their stressors that, that they're experiencing, um, not only through this quarantine, um, through the lockdowns over in Europe and the UK and, and throughout the United States and North America and seemingly the rest of the world. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's the big one, I think, outside of the book ending of the day. So I do all the things that they both just mentioned and then some more or some other things we do for stress relief other than just setting ourselves up being proactive about our stress, which I would say a lot of those things they mentioned are very proactive. But if I am in a very stressed spot, and this could also be proactive as far as scheduling it in, going for walks is very calming for me. Um, being able to play with a puzzle might be very calming for you. It could be very frustrating. So knowing yourself is going to be helpful in this. Um, being able to play with the dogs or just hang out with Alex and the dogs, um, listening to music, um, oftentimes at the end of the night to unwind, Alex and I will just sit, talk about our days and listen to music. And that's very calming and stress relieving for me. So being able to figure out what that looks like for you is reading a book. Is it doing some more like facial self-care, painting your nail stuff, whatever that looks like for you, really making sure that there is a point in the day that you're able to show up for you outside of training because training is a stress on your body. So you do want something stress relieving outside of that. So to wrap this up, we're going to touch on a few things as far as supplementation goes, as well as Alex is going to touch on if you do train late at night, how to still make sure that your sleep is in the best spot, even when your CNS is all ramped up from training. Well, before I get into supplements, there's one thing as well within the stress management aspect is that for the coaches that are listening, 2020 was was quite a um, a transformative year from a coaching perspective as it, it was a year where emotions were running so high. There was a lot of different things that your clients and yourself were going through and, and managing clients being furloughed, clients uh, losing family members to COVID, uh, our clients uh, having COVID and, and working through that nurses. I mean, there was just so many different components. And within check-ins, if you're doing multiple per day, it could have been very, very heavy on you. And that emotion and those conflicts and things that uh, transpired could weigh on you and your check-in, like your excitement to do check-ins is teetering with each one and it's weighing on you from time to time. So it's going to be important and, and something that many of you, I'm sure, uh, got a lot better with through 2020 and into this year was allowing for that check-in to be that check-in and not letting that emotion be carried with you. And something that, um, that I do personally within that, let's say that um, I mean, there's a lot of, of personal things that, that clients went through for the year, but what I will do is just write about that in their file. So when I'm going through and I'm using their, you know, like all their stuff, I'm writing about that so that I'm not carrying that into the next check-in that I'm working on. Um, because it's very easy to have all that kind of weighing on your heart. And then you're just, it's really draining you from an emotional and mental perspective. So write about those things. And if you really need to take a step away, step away from your desk, go on a walk, go play. I mean, for, for me, the, the biggest one is going 
going to play with the dogs. Our dogs are literally insane and the, <laughs> the happiest dogs in the world. So it always grounds me to play with them specifically because they they don't have they they live a very luxurious life in terms of. Um, <laughs> I was about to say they don't like have that. a worry in the world, but if you have met them, then they're very worried about when they will go outside next, when they will play next, um, when they will get whatever next. Right. Uh, so they really don't have any worries, but yeah. to them, those are their only worries. Right. And so it's really helpful for me. So hopefully that resonates with some of you. Now, when we look, do you have something to add, Austin? No, you guys know oh. it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard somebody. Anyway, supplementation. Let's dig in here. So within supplementation, this is going to be the icing on the cake. These are going to be things that are helpful, but not necessary. And I, I certainly encourage you that if you're in a bind from a financial standpoint, that if you manage all the other components that we spoke on, the supplementation aspect of things is not going to carry a whole lot of, um, you know, I guess, extra, extra benefit that's going to be light years different for you. So the first one that we wanted to speak on was fish oil. Uh, we spoke on, have we spoke on this before in a podcast? I don't believe so. No. Anyway, within this, this is going to be an anti-inflammatory. It's going to help with many internal functions within the body, eye, skin, brain health, all those different things. But from a recovery standpoint, it's going to bring down inflammation, allow for you to work from a cellular level at a very efficient rate. You're going to have EPA and DHA content within the fish oil. That's going to be a very, um, important component to your internal health. Um, within those products. A multivitamin is going to be helpful there too, which is just going to help you cover your bases from a, a vitamin perspective. Now, this is not going to substitute you having good fruits and vegetables and just quality nutrients, whole foods within your diet, but it's going to give you a good foundation within this. Now, within those two products, these are two that we would not recommend that you have pre-workout um, as they are going to carry properties that can influence or negatively influence your training performance as a whole. Now, is it the end of the world? I mean, we're talking a, an absolute nuance here. Is it the end of the world? No, it is not. But to absolutely maximize your recovery, um, or I'm sorry, more so your training performance, it's going to be more beneficial for you to have them away from your training. So maybe four hours prior to your training session, four hours post your training session, it would be a good time to have the, the fish oil, the multivitamin. If you want to touch on those nuances a little bit more, Austin, you certainly can. Yeah, it's kind of like you and another person trying to walk through the same door at the same time and no one end up going through it, um, <laughs> right? It's, they're competing pathways and, you know, think of it more or less as, you know, high, the highway system or, or whatever else. There's so many, there's a lot of, there's only so many pathways to get to a place, right? To a destination. And there's only so many roads throughout our body, highway systems without our, throughout our body. And so a lot of these, you know, can sort of overlap and, and sort of, intertwine with one another and, and use the same roads, if you will, or the same highway systems as other functions. And I, I think that's a good way to sort of put it. So, you know, to, to take fish oil, to take anti-inflammatories and, and things like that, um, high doses of antioxidants going into training that can sort of elicit a, a response by your body that sort of counteracts the acute responses that we're going to be getting from training that although on the front end may look negative, which is why we have things like fish oil and melted vitamins in our diets throughout our lives. But we need that stress, right? We need that stress from the training. We need a little bit of inflammation from training. We need a little bit of, of oxidative stress from training to uh, allow our bodies to say, Hey, we need to adapt to this. We need to get better. We need to, we need to get stronger. We need to, to improve our systems here. Um, and so if you completely nip that in the bud always, then how are you, how are you going to adapt, right? How are you going to, to cause st enough stress to, to cause adaptation to occur? So that's sort of the same thing. And I, I think, you know, the, the, I like the first example of you, just someone, you and someone else trying to walk through the same door at the same yeah. time and no one ends up going through one. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have some? I was just going to say, when it comes to these supplements, um, that they're giving you essential nutrients that you need for your body for your body to run more efficiently. So it's not that supplements are magic. It is more so that they can optimize different processes within your body. So like Alex said, within EPA and DHA, you might be like, well, what are those? Well, you need, they're essential for your body. If you didn't have them in place, you would eventually die. And so it's being able to look at, uh, we're not saying like, oh, you always need to have a million supplements to be able to be successful. I just want to be able to 
iterate and reiterate the fact that supplements, the more you learn about them, the more beneficial they can be because you're understanding, okay, why am I taking fish oil instead of just my favorite influencer on Instagram told me to take fish oil. So that's the only thing I really want to um, just really pound in there because I know supplements were the most confusing part when I was starting my fitness journey. And it's not a throw your baby, it's not throw the baby out with the bathwater situation, right? There's a lot of talk on Instagram. There's a lot of fear mongering around not taking supplements, around not doing things that could benefit your health, with I, which I think is a co- sort of a counterculture to a health-based approach to fitness, right? And, and I don't necessarily agree with a lot of people that I res- sort of respect, you know, and that's okay. You don't always agree with everyone all the time, but, um, you know, I, I think it's seemingly short-sighted in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of nuance within these topics and there's a lot of context to the individual in these topics. And I really don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, basically don't throw everything out, although there's just one bad thing to that equation, right? That's kind of the, the general gist. But yeah, it, if you're being fear mongered into like, screw all supplements, supplements are bad. The supplement industry is snake oil. And it's like, well, sure, lots of it. But that doesn't mean that there aren't good things wrapped up in it, right? That can absolutely benefit your health long-term and fill a lot of nutrient deficiencies that you may be experiencing that can help your overall health and performance and well-being, right? Which are absolutely not bad things to do. Yeah. And then uh, the next one that we wanted to speak on was protein powder. So there's a multitude of different types of protein that you can consume. You have the three main forms of, of protein are going to be a, a whey isolate, which is what um, I'll, I'll speak for myself. And, and this is what I like to have post training the most, it's going to have the the lowest degree of lactose. So greatest degree of, of well, greatest likelihood of, of best digestion, um, it is going to be the most broken down form. So the highest uh, are the the speediest form of digestion, if you will, and generally is going to be pretty lightly flavored. Uh, you have other forms such as whey concentrate, which is going to carry a greater degree of lactose going to be a little bit slower digesting. And then you have the slower digesting relative to the whey isolate, and you're going to have casein protein, which is going to be your highest lactose content, as well as as your uh, slowest digesting. Now there's going to be blends and things of that nature. Um, but within the coming back to the way I the reason that I like it the most and um, sources that we utilize, they're going to be um, a grass fed way isolate that is not going to carry any artificial sweeteners, uh, sweetened with stevia or, or monk fruit or something of that nature. Just not from like a all artificial sweeteners are bad standpoint, but more so of I want to feel great after my training session. I do not want anything weighing heavy on my stomach. So the lighter flavoring of the way isolates is important. The uh, the fat allotment, if you will, the carbohydrates allotment is going to be a lot lower. So you're going to carry a small degree of calories from fats and carbs and a high degree of protein. 20 to 25 grams is, is generally the realm there, which we already spoke on is going to uh, be kind of a good threat threshold for muscle protein synthesis. And then pairing that with a a nice little carb source is is my fave rice and grinds being specific there. (laughs) Um, And then creatine, this is going to be important as well. This is going to help with overall recovery five grams of creatine monohydrate is a good threshold on on that front. Um, Now within that, this is going to uh, make a the energy source within your body atp is going once it is expended turns into adp the beauty of creatine is that uh generally what would happen with that adp is that it would be excreted through our urine it's not usable anymore the beauty of creatine is that it turns that adp back into an atp so um, it's like a, a recycling system if you will for your energy uh, systems as well as it's going to increase the fluid that is being stored intramuscularly so you may have heard ah uh, that water retention from, uh, that the creatine, I gained like five or six pounds that first week. I I couldn't get it off. I mean, I just looked like a blob. That's not true. Um, it's just not true. Uh, I don't really know how else to say it. It is going to be storing that water intramuscularly, not subcutaneously as previously, um, fear mongered into. And then you're going to have magnesium. So magnesium is your muscles homey. It is a mineral that is very, very important from a muscle contractile state as well as recovery standpoint. So things that we need um, 
to be present when we're, we're maximizing uh, muscle contractions is going to be uh, potassium, sodium, we need glucose, we need water, and we need magnesium, all five and of calcium. those things. And calcium, sorry. There you go. Um, those things need to be present to allow for us to have the, the best um, contractions possible. And then the magnesium is also going to be helpful from a recovery standpoint. Many people are going to be deficient in magnesium. Um, I think the, the percentage is 80% of, of Americans is, are are. Yeah, 80% deficient. of adults. 80% of adults. Um, and this is because it can be depleted from a, a stress perspective. Uh, the foods that they're consuming are not rich in magnesium. So having a magnesium supplement is very important. Now, the type of magnesium is very important as well. So if you're utilizing a magnesium oxide or a magnesium citrate, these are going to more so act on the GI tract. This is going to be a stool softener. It is going to aid in your bowel movements rather than actually give you benefit to your, your muscle contractions and recovery. So the form that we uh, promote, or not promote, but yeah, I guess promote, yeah. um, is going to be magnesium glycinate. From a research perspective, that is going to be the highest absorption form of magnesium that we've found thus far. If anybody has uh, contradicting research, please share because I would I would love to have an even better source. But um, yeah, magnesium is going to be important. Something you want to utilize post training. Something you want to utilize um, before bed as well. And I do want to mention one, go one last thing on on creatine there. Um, kind of a good way to think about. So if you're a little confused, allow Alex to get a drink of water here. If you're a little confused on um, the adenosine, the 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 A and the T and the P. Um, so the adenosine triphosphate. Okay. We're going a little bit to chemistry here, but stand or, or stay with us. So if you kind of think of the, the, the role that phosphate would play, the creatine phosphate, which is the creatine supplementation that you're taking. Okay. This is why creatine is very important. So imagine tug of war. You have two sides, two teams on tug of war. The rope is the adenosine. The rope is the A in the equation. The P is essentially those people holding the rope, right? So we have three on each side, let's say, and with each tug back and forth, one person drops off. That is just a cost of that energy going back and forth, right? So we have a lot of people standing around in a circle, cheering them on. All of those guys, think of them as creatine phosphate. Think of them as the supplementation, right? And as soon as one falls down, a phosphate from the crowd jumps in and <laughs> replaces them, right? That's essentially what's happening there. Um, and so that's really it. And obviously, if there's more people in the crowd, you're, it's going to, let's say the crowd is the muscle itself, that crowd is going to weigh a bit more because there's more creatine within the system. It does pull water into that system, right? And that's where you kind of gain that weight on the scale because it's pulling a little bit of water within, with that person, with that phosphate from the crowd to jump in, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring water with that person. So all in all, that's kind of how creatine does work. Um, and so very simplistic way of explaining it. Um, but that's, if you're scared by creatine, if you've been fear mongered out of creatine usage, male or female, um, or however you identify, it's, it's one of those things where creatine is very valuable for strength performance can help with recovery in that regard as well. Um, so don't be feared out of it. Um, but if you're scared about it, if you, if you want to check, if you have any, you know, pre-existing metabolic conditions or something like that, do, do check with your physicians about these things. But Creatine all in all is the most researched thing out, out there as far as the supplement world goes. And it's very, very safe and effective. So I just wanted to add that in. That came to mind. And I was like, I think this is going to be helpful for people. So. <laughs> um, and then the the last thing would be theanine, which is just going to be an amino acid that's going to help with um, just neural um, relaxation. It's going to help with calming down the nervous system, something that uh, is is very important, especially for those who are training later in the evening. I know that uh, there are times where I, where I myself or, or Austin have to train later in the evening because of schedule conflicts. Um, but if you are training later in the evening, theanine is going to be very helpful for you to get into a restful state. Because uh, I know that those late sessions, eight, nine o'clock at night, and then trying to get yourself to a are in bed and asleep at a normal time is very, very challenging. So theanine can be very helpful there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And with theanine, the great thing is that it doesn't have any sedative properties or 
like it's not going to make you sleepy. Um, like a melatonin might make you sleepy. So you're not going to take melatonin at any other time during the day. But theanine is something that even like, let's say you have a very high intensity workout, you could take theanine post training to be able to calm down in that situation. Or since we did talk about stress, if you are seeing yourself stressed at different points, I will implement um, either magnesium or theanine in those places to be able to help out. Um, so multi and everything works together. How cool does that? Very cool. <laughs> Pretty cool. Pretty neat. Pretty cool. Are we done? We good? Yeah. We're talking it out. Good. I think awesome. one thing I will add is that if you guys like all these things could have their own episode. Like we could talk about the sleep aspect for an hour. We could talk about all these different things for an hour a piece. If you guys want us to dig deeper on a specific uh, within this, I think training, I mean, training could be multiple episodes. We could do part 10. I mean, we could do 10 <laughs> parts to that. Um, we could definitely do that. Just, uh, I guess, DM us or, or however the best way of communicating with us, email us um, what topics you would like to to hear more in depth. Awesome. Thanks guys so much for listening. Um, that was a deep dive all about recovery. We'll see you guys in the next episode. If you guys do have any questions or anything like that, please do just send them over to our Instagram or uh, you can email us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at physiquedevelopment.com and you will be divvied up to whoever you need to speak to essentially. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. And if we don't enjoy the rest of your day.